So the background of this is that I have known since 1980 that, uh, that I'm God's messenger in the sense that, uh, not in the, in the general sense, in the sense that uh, Abraham was the original messenger of Islam. He brought all the practices, the namaz, the fasting, the zakat, charity, the pilgrimage, and of course the first commandment, la ilaha illallah. And Muhammad brought the Quran, and, and uh, that I am the third of a, of a triangle, that I brought the proof, the, the proof of authenticity of the religion. I didn't know that uh, I am God's messenger in that sense until uh, 1980. 1980 was corresponding to the year 1400, the Islamic uh, year. God has been gracious to us in that he's been showing us what the correct Islam is. The, the Mohammedans throughout the world, a hundred million of them, are doing the Salat wrong. We mention Muhammad Ali Muhammad, Ibrahim Ali Ibrahim in the Salat. And we know now for sure that this is wrong. The Quran that came out of Muhammad's mouth says that you should never mention any other name during the Salat besides other than the name of God, that the Salat must be devoted to God alone and no one else. So they did the Salat wrong. They did the Zakat wrong. They are doing it wrong. And now we have it corrected. It turns out that as it is now done, going to Medina is the most important part of Hajj, even though it is not part of Hajj at all in the Quran. And going to Medina is uh, flagrant idol worship. They go to the Prophet's tomb or to Fatima's tomb and they, they pray and implore nothing. They are quoting the Quran because on the Day of Judgment say we were worshipping nothing. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi man wala. I'd like to welcome everyone to our second episode, uh, season four, episode two. Now, we don't have Mu'in, Naz, and Alex or Saad today. All of them are away. Alex is away. Uh, Mu'in and Naz couldn't make it. But we do have uh, Hamza Q. Still there go. Fresh out of law school, right? Still in. Still in law school? Year yeah. three? Well, year three just starting. Well, year three is a formality anyway, right? Kind of, yeah. Yeah, it's just it a really formality. <laughs> and we have uh, Jake. we got brother Jake. What's your last name? Brancatella. Who? Brancatella. Okay. So Jake from Little Italy. <laughs> <laughs> Jake is our guest today. Jake is from, he's from the area, okay? He's someone we just met, and he just, um, he has an interesting story. And we also have Dr. Harris, I mean, world-renowned uh, eye surgeon. If you need an eye surgeon, I mean, that's where you're going to go. Everyone knows that, right? <laughs> but uh, we're going to start today on a topic that uh, is really all about uh, Jake's past maybe decade, I would say. And that is that you used to be part of the Sunnah Rejectors. I call them Sunnah Rejectors. They call right. themselves Quran only, right? These folks. You, you, you became Muslim and joined that group, right? Right. Okay, mm -hmm. so tell me exactly... You come into Islam, how, would, how does that fringe group get onto your radar? Well, basically, I had a friend in high school who introduced me to Islam. And um, I just started reading the Quran by myself. Mm -hmm. And long story short, I accepted that it was true. You know, I have a Catholic background. But I accepted the Quran as true, um, but mainly based on its theology and uh, Tawheed mm -hmm. and after that I started having discussions with this friend and he would say things to me all the time like regarding the deen and say oh well this is what Allah says in the Quran and, and different things and he would say things to me and I'm like well dude that's that's not in the Quran mm. so I don't know what you're talking about and you know uh, not to bash him but he wasn't that knowledgeable so the things that he was saying he wasn't properly differentiating between what was found in the Quran and what was found in the Hadith. Mm. So because of that, it confused me. Mm. And I didn't even know what Hadith was. Mm -hmm. So then eventually he got around to telling me about, well, we have this other thing called Hadith. 
And I said, well, what's that? Because I don't know anything about that from the Quran. And so he started explaining it, and it didn't make sense to me at the time, um, being a person who didn't know that much, and just reading the Quran by myself. And so I started looking up online, well, are there other people out there that believe like I do, that only mm. believe in the Quran, that don't believe in this Hadith stuff? So I found uh, Rashad uh, Khalifa. Okay. I don't know if you've heard of him. Let's give a little blurb about mm-hmm. people. Why don't you give a little blurb about the guy? Rashad Khalifa? Yeah. Um, from what I know, he uh, was from Egypt. Uh-huh. He's Egyptian. Uh, I think he was a chemist. And um, he supposedly came upon this miracle in the Quran, the miracle of 19, which I also used to believe in. I don't anymore. And uh, it's kind of a cult about like everything is 19 in the Quran and all this and that. And uh, I read a short book on him called Quran, Hadith and Islam. And it basically explained why we don't need Hadith, why we should only be following the Quran and all these kind of things. And he had, he had a group called the uh, Submitters uh, that were based in Arizona. And eventually, he was actually, from what I understand, he was assassinated mm-hmm. um, by I don't know who. But yeah, Jamata Fukur. Right. Got him, yeah. Because I think they put a, a, you know a, them? a fatwa against him. Yeah. And, um, and one, of the, one of the other brothers that was with him was a, a fellow by the name of Edip Yuxel, who actually, I actually met personally, and he interv- interviewed me on his YouTube channel mm. and uh, earlier this year, actually. And um, then when he passed, when Rashad passed away, he kind of took over, and, but he broke away from the submitters, and now there's a bunch of people that follow him, and he's still promoting this 19 stuff on YouTube and mm. Quran alone and all that kind of stuff. But uh, that's the gist of it. So his uh, theory of 19, every surah has got a number 19 uh, mm-hmm. somehow connected to it. Right. But it collapses at the end, though. Mm-hmm. Right. His theory collapsed at the end. Is uh, that true? Yeah. Well, there's different reasons why I don't accept it. I, I did originally. Uh, I did originally, but mm-hmm. now I reject it because... I'm not a mathematician, but if you know anything about a mathematical theory, you have to have uh, a certain amount of possible outcomes, right? That we could say, well, the ma- let's take 19, for example. What are the possible applications for the number 19 in the Quran? None of these people can answer that. Yeah. In order to, for us to determine if the probability is high enough for it not to be... Um, just uh, some lucky chance of 19 always coming out. We have to know what the uh, numerator and denominator are to find out what the percentage is. Mm -hmm. And they don't have this. So in my opinion, the theory can't even get off the ground because you can't evaluate it. There's no set standard Mm -hmm. as to what sort of things are applicable to 19 and what aren't. Uh, For example, they use the uh, Bismillah they think that it has 19 letters in it. Um, the number of surahs in the Quran, 114 divided by 19, it comes out to a whole number. All these different things. But what actually is 19 supposed to be applied yeah. to? Does it apply to every single letter? Mm. Is it certain words? You know, because even Rashad thinks that his name, Rashad, is in the Quran and it's a multiple of 19. All these kind of things. So it's just numerology and there's no set system as to how we can determine whether or not it applies yeah so there number one there's no one set equation either right. so in bismillah rahman rahim he's mm-hmm. just doing one plus one plus one. he's counting right. letters right whereas the surahs mm-hmm. it's a factor of 19 right right exactly. so that's a whole different mathematical operation so it's any I, I mean i would think any surah with enough words mm-hmm. you can find some equation to do it 19 mm-hmm. right? right like the number of verses could be divisible by 19 the mm-hmm. number of words could be divisible by 19 right right, D- right. whatever but so it's he's you it seems like it's all different random mathematical functions connected to 19 that's why it broke down at the la- small surahs right because and not enough words right and yeah. even like the word Allah in the quran yeah he says that it's a multiple of 19 but in order for 
if you ca actually count the number of times that Allah's name is mentioned in the Quran, in order for it to work as a multiple of 19, they had to deny two verses in the mm. Quran at the end of chapter 9. I think it's verse uh, 128 and 29 to balance it out now and mm. in order to make it a multiple of 19. But even even if we granted that and said, okay, well, Allah's name is mentioned the multiple of 19 in the Quran. What about his other attributes? They use, for example, uh, Edith Yuxel has a whole book on it about certain attributes that have a multiple of 19. But why some and not others? Like, yeah. what is the... What is the um, system that we're basing this on why are we counting some letters like even the the letters like alif lam mim at the beginning of a surah yeah. right they say that there's some connection with that to the multiples of like the alifs in that surah yeah the lambs and they count them there's no there's no set framework to really judge what's what's being asserted secondly out of three critiques that's the first critique mm -hmm. that you're using all sorts of different types of equations right, right? number two Let's hypothetically say, for argument's sake, mm -hmm. that we did find that the number 19 was found in some s mathematical formula in every surah. All right. So what is the value of 19? Like, what's right. the actual substantive mm -hmm. connection to the number to some meaning? Like, what is actually what is the meaning of it? Right. You know? Well, they would claim that it's a miracle because it's a prime number. So it. It has less of a chance uh, fitting into, you know, the yeah. multiples and stuff like that. But other than that, I don't think. OK, it so I mean, so, y sense. so you, you would uh, tell someone that your basis of your belief is that the book has mathematical equations connected to a prime number. Right. Uh, and, and actually, a, it's a stretch. Actually, they go so far. Some of them of saying like eat up Yuxel. Uh, he's from Turkey, and he's actually, for his beliefs, he's been banned from Turkey. Uh, <laughs> they they put a fatwa against him too. He's they've Erdogan have, banned him. He, I don't know <laughs> who because yeah. I don't know how long ago it was, but um, people have uh, attempted to kill him before and wow. all everything, just like they they did to uh, Rashad uh, Khalifa. But um, anyway, with him, he goes so far as saying that. Even if you accept his principle of Quran alone and all that kind of stuff, rejecting Hadith, if you reject this 19 principle, you're a Kafir. Oh, really? You're, you're going to hell. And what's his basis for that? Um, at, he, at, the, at the comedy level at this point. He, he, right. He uses uh, some set of verses in uh, chapter 74. I don't know if I could pull it up real quick because I, I don't have it off the top of my head. 74 is the Mudeth. Yeah, yeah, right. Uh, yeah, so it says, uh, it says, it leaves naught and spares naught. It scorches the mortal. Over it, over it are 19. Yeah. Now, typically, the, correct me if I'm wrong, the traditional understanding is this talking about the 19 guardians of, of hellfire, That's right? correct, yeah. He understands that to mean the Quran. 19 guarding this Quran, right? And the next verse says, and we made it none but angels, wardens of the fire, and we have not made their number but as a trial, a fitna, for those who disbelieve. Which he actually fell into the fitna. Right, right but, but he's using that to say that yeah. this is a fitna, this is a trial. Mm. If you don't accept this 19, you're, you're, going, you're a kafir, you're, you're going to hell. You disbelieve. <laughs> right, yeah. you disbelieve. So he believes the number 19 is guardian over the Quran. Right, exactly. But what is, is, it a, is it a living thing? Uh, is the number 19 alive? No, I just, in the mathematical sense. So I mean, a non-living thing is guarding the word of Allah. Right. So and, and, and the verse goes on further to say that those who have been given the book may be certain, and those who, who believe may increase in faith, and those who have been given the book and the believers may not doubt, and that those in whose hearts is a disease and the disbelievers may say, what does Allah mean by this parable, meaning the, the number? That's mm -hmm. what he's assuming. Thus Allah leaves in error whom he pleases and guides whom he pleases, and it goes on. But the point is, he's saying that this number, Allah is, is giving you the idea that it's going to increase the believers in faith, and it's going to differentiate between the believers and the mm -hmm. non-believers. So what he would come back and say to the traditional Sunni would be, well, how is a number of angels, 19, over hellfire going to do that? 
So he would say that that doesn't make any sense. Yeah. And he thinks that it applies to this principle of 19 guarding the Quran wow. and that it being a miracle. And that would make more sense of the verse. So, so this is what you came across right away when you became Muslim. Right, right. Originally from Rashad. And from then, the Internet. Right. Which is really a justification. It justifies people, uh, you know, young scholars and imams and fuqaha basically need to flood the internet with actual truth mm-hmm. and sensible sensible talk because if people are going to come across this then we need to decrease the percentage chance that they're going to come across nonsense like this and waste like a decade of their life on a ridiculous theory that has no basis right well not only that um the there have been traditional sunnis who have now adopted this modern modern scholars and yeah. i I don't know if you want me to mention any names. I mean, but if, if they're public about it. Yeah, they have been. Um, I mean, Ahmed Didat even um, published a book about it that was basically from uh, Rashad uh, Khalifa. Mm-hmm. And, um, All about the number 19. Shabir Ali promotes it. Number 19. Yes. Okay. Tell me what exactly is the lived experience? Like, how does this apply to daily life? Number 19? Yeah. Well, I have to be honest. When I, it's like a cult. When I was I, when I was heavy into it, if I put a slice of pizza in the microwave, I put it on nineteen. <laughs> if I had, my, if I, it's a superstition, right? Exactly. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. Obviously, it was it was ridiculous. Yeah. You know, if I'm watching TV, I'm putting the volume to number nineteen. These kind of crazy. Th- I'm not saying that yeah. they're doing that, but this is what I was doing. Yeah. Um, they're not taking it to that level. But, for example, like Edip Yuxel and even um, Shabir Ali, he's got videos on YouTube about it. People can go watch it on his channel where he's promoting this. And he uses it as a proof that the Quran is from God. You know, just like Edip Yuxel was doing, not necessarily from that verse. Yeah. But he gives certain general principles about 19, how many suras there are, all these different kind of things. And... Um, he promotes it, and he originally got it from, from Rashad, Rashad, Khalifa. Rashad. Yeah, Rashad Khalifa. Yeah. I have a question. Has this 19 thing been something throughout history, or is this new? Because I've never heard of this before. i never seen it in traditional scholarship, nor did I see any of the numerology that modern folks have come up with, some of which is nice. Like, okay, the no- exact number of time Yom is used, 365. Okay, it's nice, right? It's Definitely, you're going to know that it's possible for Allah to do something like this to show that the messenger would not have had time for something like this, right? And no Sahabi recognized it, and the Prophet didn't go tell the people that. So it's it's something. It's something that I would actually remember when we studied the sciences of the Quran, mm-hmm. that I put it at the last page as just like a nice thing. There's no added commentary to it. Right. But where the number 19 goes off being that miracle, okay, so everything factors to 19 somehow. I still don't get how this is a big deal, let alone how does it affect your life. Right. So what they would say, like, even in Edip Yuxel's books that he has about this thing, he mentions, like, what you mentioned about uh, the not, the um, number of times that days is mentioned in the Quran. Uh-huh. The singular form is mentioned 365 times. Yeah. And then, basically, the extension of that is 19 to say... Like, these things are cool, like you're saying, the little little things that, uh, you know, might be good for us to know. But 19 is on a higher level. So it's basically exponentially greater than these, uh, the number of times, days, as mentioned, and et cetera. But, but uh, you can stand and someone say in 60 seconds, Yom, day, 365 times. I think Layl, the same thing, right? Then shahr, month, 12 times. Right. A.M., days, mm-hmm. I think uh, seven seven times or 30 times, right? right. Some, it's either week or month. It's something right. like that. Right. Um, then like water and, uh, and land at the mm-hmm. proportion of land and sea. So I could s- roll it off my tongue in 60 seconds right. or in half a page of a book, mm-hmm. meaning that it's that simple. Right. But 19 sounds like it requires like a 400-page thesis, right? So it's not that simple. And a miracle needs to be simple, right? Right. Moses split the Red Sea. Simple. Mm -hmm. It's not something, you know, convoluted. So this 19, to prove your amen, no one needs to sit there reading a book. 
Right. Like, give me the simple 60-second version. Right, exactly. And he and Ida Buxel has a whole, like you said, about a 400-page book that I read the whole thing on it yeah. on 19 trying to prove that 19 is, is, is true. From, so. my, from my experience, when you need to write that much, your argument is flawed. Right. Right? You know, Maddox has a thing, has a statement where he says, إِذَا صَحَّ الْجَوَابِ قَلَّ الْكَلَامِ Which means, if the answer is right, the speech is little. Mm-hmm. Right? So if you have something great to say, it wouldn't need mm-hmm. that much. So we're going to need to read that much. It's bigger than the Quran. <laughs> I would have read the whole Quran, right? And gotten more out of it than his theory about the Quran. Right. Okay, so all that was a little tangent. Actually, we started off with a tangent because the first thing that you, you came into was this, was this crazy theory. Mm-hmm. Now we need to get into how you got into uh, uh, Quran only. But first, we're going to pause for Maghrib and we'll be right back. All right. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. We're back from Salat al-Maghrib. Now, we actually started off with the one subject, but we ended up taking a little detour into... Well, something in Muslim American history. Me and Sam Kadavik love to like document all these little things in Muslim American history mm-hmm. because you know people like to have a history. Right. So we're talking Arizona, 1980s. Mm-hmm. Egyptian immigrant comes. Now it's not just that the number 19 got him killed. It's mm-hmm. like I mentioned when we were making before Salah. I th- I could have sworn he claimed to be a prophet, right? And you said no. He he's actually claimed something bigger than that. Right, he claimed to be a messenger. Okay, Me- that's and a- that specific verses in the Quran replied to him. So, like you know how sometimes in an English translation, it'll say "Oh Muhammad, peace be upon him," like yeah. in that it's referring to him. He has "Oh Rashad," like he thinks it's talking to him. To him, yeah. So at this point, we're talking about insanity, pretty much. Yeah, yeah. Because if you're at that level, right, that even the idea of bringing a theory that your peers would just laugh you out of the room. And you're serious about it. That itself it would most people would say that you're insane, right? Definitely. So let alone claiming prophecy. Now, how did he maintain a followership? This, I mean, Qadiani's claim prophecy, not mm-hmm. messengership. Right. All right. He's claiming messengership. Mm-hmm. So what did his followers do? They 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 followed along. And what was his new law that he came with? No, well, he wasn't claiming, as far as I know, to come with any new law, but he was claiming to unveil this miracle of 19 that could, uh, as we talked about a little bit before we came live, that could only be discovered with the advent of computers. That was a great point by Dr. Amin. So that in 1974, supposedly, when this was uh, recognized, it had to be done by a computer, and so he th- he thinks that it's directly related to him, and that's the prophecy. So there's a uh, Pakistani uh, sheikh who is a self, who's a sort of a self-taught uh, uh, sheikh, but he apparently has a lot of um, karamat. His name is Mubarak Ali Shah Jalani. He came in, he got a following of, of, of converts in New York City, and they're the ones who actually... Uh, put out the hit on this guy they, oh, they're really? the ones who killed him really? it's called Jamaat al-Fuqra and they were known for being very isolationists so mm-hmm. they live in like little towns like Islamville and those things mm-hmm. um, and they are uh, they sort of say to themselves in the beginning they were a little bit violent so that's why when what was his name Pearl Adam Pearl I'm not sure from Wall Street Journal the kid the the, the journalist who was kidnapped Pearl Daniel Pearl when Daniel Pearl the Wall Street journalist was kidnapped and killed they mm-hmm. first thought it was him because Daniel Pearl was going to interview Mubarak Ali Shah Jalani, right? Mm-hmm. And ask him about some of the violent things that were happening in his group. So that's where Daniel Pearl went to interview, mm-hmm. okay? Because Daniel, the Jalani group or Jamal al Fukra, they were um, involved in some violent stuff like really? that. Now, you also, to, so. I didn't know that there were a lot of 19ers. You said these 19ers are going to come after us now. And I thought <laughs> I had run out of people to, 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 to go up against. But so these people actually still exist? Oh, yeah. There's a lot of 19ers, uh, especially on Facebook, like different Facebook groups, if you search it. Um, the submitters actually still have their own website, uh, not to try to give them a plug or anything. Yeah. Uh, but Edip, what is their website? Edip Yuxel also, uh, who's the main, he now basically the baton was passed from Rashad uh, Khalifa to Edip Yuxel, and his website is called 19.org. 
So even though, you know, you would think that being a proponent of the so-called Quran alone movement, your website would have something to do with that. But he's more fixed even more so on this 19 stuff. And it's just per- his website is permeated with that. So you could go to uh, 19.org and check it out. Uh, what is a submitter's website? Uh, I don't know off the top of my head. but Message to Tucson.org? Yes, that's it. Yep. So yep. are you telling me that Sunnah rejectors mm-hmm. in America will tend to be tied to the hip to the 19 theory? Uh, not necessarily. There's, um, I would say, a large portion of them. I would mm-hmm. say maybe about 50% are, are into 19. And, uh, but a lot, of, a lot of Quran alone people aren't. Okay. Now, I tend not to really worry or give much credence to any organization or group mm-hmm. that has an unactionable theory, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, their, their premise is there's no action based on their premise. That's number one, right? right? Number two, uh, you want to show me something? What's this? Rashad Khalifa's son is a shortstop for the Pittsburgh Pirates? I mean, this cannot get any weirder. Oh, his batting average. 219. <laughs> <laughs> it's oh, a prophecy. I'm telling you, this stuff cannot get any weirder. I honestly didn't even know that. Sam Khalifa, born December 5th, 1963, is an American former professional baseball player, an infielder. He played for the Pittsburgh Pirates from 1985 to 1987. He, re- he retired from baseball when his father, Rashad Khalifa, was murdered in 1990. Right. I mean, how many? I suppose we we're supposed to start counting how many letters in Pittsburgh Pirates, <laughs> right? And see if it's divisible by 19. But that is the weird. This is a, such a weird like piece of history. Yeah, he probably is the only Muslim baseball. I mean, if he, if he, unless he followed his father, then yeah. what? Uh, so tell us now, these 19ers, like, where is the application? I'm not worried about this group. There's mm-hmm. no application. You're not gathering people, you're not raising kids on this stuff. Right. So this type of thing, it, it, it fizzles out. Like mm-hmm. lone wolf type of people will read it, be convinced for a couple of years, mm-hmm. and hopefully the bulk of them, when they need to get married and interact with real human beings, will wake up one day. That's my opinion on it, right? Inshallah. But yeah. like we said before, there are some pretty big names, even uh, Sunni yeah. scholars promoting this kind of stuff. I'm, I mean, obviously not a lot, the majority think it's nonsense yeah but just to beware of that so i mean we have to even watch out for these people and that when they're promoting it yeah expose that this is just nonsense, it's nonsense and, yeah. uh, and allah's not going to bring something right. from uh the ghaib uh, uh, of his book mm-hmm. uh, through the hands of some fraud who's going to say he's a messenger right exactly simple as that anything that comes from them I'm going to reject it in lock, stock, and barrel. Exactly. Right? And if, it, if they had any truth to it, then I could discover it on my own. Right. So that I never have to credit a fraud. Right. Let's, Hamza, you want to add any last thing before we move on to from, uh, from 19? No, that's enough. Okay. <laughs> 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 All right. Uh, let's now move to how you went from 19ers to Quran only. And, 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 and I'm asking specifically, what were the websites, for example, that that got onto your radar because if they got onto your radar, they're probably getting on other people's radar. I'm actually wondering more about the, the practical trajectory of how you got into this idea. Okay. So although Rashad was promoting 19, he was also promoting the Quran alone stuff. Mm-hmm. So like I said, the first book that I read on the topic was a little booklet called uh, Quran, Hadith and Islam. Mm-hmm. And, um, it, I vaguely, I, I don't remember exactly what was in it. It might have had some 19 stuff in it, but the, for the most part, it was promoting the idea of Quran alone. He was citing verses in the Quran that supposedly supported this opinion and all this kind of stuff. And so that's really uh, what first I, as far as actual material that I first read on it. And um, then once I realized, well, this guy's dead, I need some kind of other person who's still producing stuff mm. to read. Uh, I found Edip Yuxel, who has a number of different books out, some on 19, some on the Quran only stuff. And so I started reading his material. 
And um, yeah, so that that's kind of how it went. So EDP Oxal is considered one of the big uh, Sunni rejector Quran only types. Oh yeah, big, big. Yeah, he's okay. he's banned from Turkey because of it. Um, he actually appeared on a Turkish uh, television sh- television show, and he was like debating a, a Sunni, mm-hmm. and the guy just walked off the stage. He was just like, it, "Yeah, you can still. I think it's on YouTube. You can still pull it up." But uh, yeah, he's definitely, especially in America, he's I would say one of the top three biggest proponents of this idea. Who are the other two? Um, well, another one is a, a guy that I was very close with, named Hamza Abdul Malik. And um, his videos are on YouTube, too. And uh, he's a very well-known proponent of this. He was a a Sunni for about 40 years. And he was even known in the Sunni community for debating Christians. And um, he was actually taught in uh, Ahmadid at school in Mm -hmm. South Africa. He was um, basically Ahmadidat's representative in, in the U.S. for debating Christians at the time that this was going on. And um, later on, he discovered, according to him, that um, the Hadith stuff was nonsense and so that we only need to follow the Quran. And he's been that way for, I don't know, maybe the past 15 years or so. And so he's another big proponent of this idea. Um, <clears throat> then you got a guy by the name of Sam Jerrins, who yes, I think that's the guy. He's originally from England. Yeah. And I think he moved. I don't know where he's living now, uh, but he's got some crazy ideas as well. He's, he's all into conspiracy theories and all this kind of stuff. Um, who else? I think those are the main guys. Okay. Now, in terms of uh, the, these guys' uh, uh, work, mainly it's, it's on YouTube. Yes, mainly it's on YouTube, but Edip Yuxil has a lot of uh, publications. He has a whole book on 19, uh, and he's got other books in related Islamic subjects. Okay. And he's got his, uh, he has his own translation of the Quran, actually. All right, so a young a l- a listeners out there, like, first time hearing about this group, give me the top two or three arguments that they're going to th- throw at someone, because... Yeah, a lot of people know about this, and it doesn't. And like Moeen made a good point. He said we don't we we know that we need to refute it. Everyone knows uh, our position on this, and you can easily find refutations of this. But just for a quick like soundbite version of what would their main arguments be, and then what would a quick um, refutation that will completely that they don't have any answer to uh, be, so that people could have some idea of what, what what they would be getting into if they saw someone who was a Quran only. Right. So for the people who aren't so familiar with it, basically their view is that the Quran alone is sufficient for all matters of the deen, right? Okay. In terms of guidance and, and all related subjects. Um, that it's complete, perfect, fully detailed, and the like. Um, so one of the verses that they'll use and that I've used in the past is uh, in chapter 6, verse 114. And it says, uh, shall I seek a judge other than a law when, it, when he it is who has sent down to you the book fully explained? And those whom we have given the book know that it is revealed by thy Lord with truth. So be not thou of the disputers. So the gist of it is basically that Allah is saying in, in this verse, what was sent down to the messenger was the book. That's the only thing that was sent down to him. And that this book is mufassal. It's fully detailed, right? So the idea is that the presupposition behind it is to say that the Sunni uh, understanding assumes that the Quran is not fully detailed. It provides some of the details, but other details that are necessary to practice the deen are found in hadith books, Mm -hmm. right? So they say, well, this directly contradicts what Allah is saying in this verse because he says it's fully detailed. And your view amounts to basically calling Allah a liar because you're saying it's not fully detailed. Mm. So, you know, that's that's a verse that they would typically um, use for that. Uh, then also in uh, chapter 45, verse 6, there's a, a verse that says, In what hadith after Allah and his ayat will you trust? And they say that if you trust because the Quran is mentioned as a hadith, 
mm. in uh, chapter 39, verse 23. It's mentioned as the best hadith, actually, mm. um, which Sunnis accept. Um, but so they say this is the hadith. And 45.6 says you can't trust in any hadith after Allah in his ayats, mm. which we know the Quran is ayat. So uh, based on this principle, they say we reject any hadith besides the Quran. Um, and then you have, uh, I'll just give one more verse uh, about in terms of guidance in chapter 10, uh, verse 35. And just scroll to it real quick. Mm-hmm. Hamza, you do it with these types of people before? I have actually not met anyone who has who's very detailed about it. Most mm. people are kind of it's just a method of argumentation. Yeah. It's mm. like Just to just to fulfill some desire or other. Yeah, they'll be like, Oh, show me where it says this in the Quran. Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. It's like, Oh, I don't care what it says in the hadith and they'll mostly be like, Oh, the hadith like the orientalist arguments they're compiled yeah. two hundred years after. Right. It's mostly a way, like you said, just people wanting to, to do what they want to justify some shahwa yeah right desire okay so uh, so in this last verse is uh, it says say is there any of your associate gods who guides to the truth say a law guides to the truth is he who then who guides to the truth more worthy to be followed or he who finds not the way unless he is guided what is the matter with you how do you judge mm-hmm. so it's comparing uh the person who basically in the parable f- who's following a law versus following anybody else who had to be guided now the question is did the messenger peace be upon him have to be guided mm. well they use verses uh, like mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. we found you astray and we guided you or other verses like you didn't know what the book or faith was you see so he had to be guided so by that principle they're saying who's more worthy to be followed mm. the messenger or a law and the obvious answer according yeah. to them is a law so that's um, another proof that they would use that in terms of guidance, their own, the only source that they're going to accept is Allah himself, you see. Question, uh, where do they think that the Quran came to them from? It was transmitted by human beings over centuries, right or wrong? Yes. They're accepting that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so uh, the basic understanding obviously is the same as the traditional uh, understanding that it was from Allah to uh, Angel Jibril to the, the prophet, prophet, peace be upon him, and then to the companions. disseminated to you know the immediate community. Why do they trust that transmission? Uh, that's a good question. Um, how do we, I guess the question comes, how do we know that the Quran that we have today is what was actually revealed to the prophet? Because if they trust that transmission, mm-hmm. those transmitters also transmitted hadith right i think what they would say is uh for example in chapter 15 verse 9 allah says that he's going to protect this quran that he's the protector of the quran but nowhere does it say that he's going to protect protect the sunnah or hadith or anything else like that so i think they would say even if these people were the same people who transmitted um a hadith uh allah didn't vouch for uh that material but they're the ones who transmitted that verse. Yes. <laughs> right? Definitely. So if they're saying that they're, they used hadith and they were basically misguided, mm-hmm. but they're the ones who gave you that verse. So mm-hmm. they're furnishing you your evidence. Right. Right? Mm-hmm. Which you then use to discredit the need for their transmission. Mm-hmm. Right? So it's circular. Right. Hamza. Are they doubting the veracity of the transmissions or are they doubting the value of of the transmission of oh. the hadith versus the Quran. Okay, good. So that's a good point because what basically what you mentioned before, uh, at least the folks that you came in contact were kind of just coming with a simpleton argument of saying we don't really trust the transmissions. Bukhari compiled this two hundred years after the Prophet, and so on. Um, uh, and there are a lot of uh, Quran alone people who have that mentality, but at least the. The group that I was a part of and the more intellectual ones, if we could use that, uh, would give these kind of verses in the Quran that I'm using to say that even if these transmissions were accurate, they're not to be followed because the Quran itself uh, rejects any other source besides itself for Muslims to be following. So, so So, but as a secondary issue, they will challenge the transmission of of the uh, hadith so if they were standing face to face with the prophet and mm-hmm. he and he said 
X. Would mm-hmm. they reject that? Uh, yeah, so that's a good point. I think if they held true to their principles, they would have to. They would have to ask, well, is this Quran? And if he, if he said no, then they would they would have to just be like, we're not interested in that, whatever else well, it is what besides about, that. What about the Quran saying you have to obey the Prophet? Obey Allah and his messenger. Right. So um, they would understand obey Allah and obey the messenger as obey the messenger means obey the message. And what was the message that he was giving was only the Quran. And uh, they use some verses to distinguish between um, his role as a messenger and what his role was as a prophet and a regular man. And um, basically the proof for that is that any time that the prophet is chided in the Quran for making some kind of mistakes, Allah never uses the term messenger to apply to him. He only u- refers to him in the masculine singular form mm. or as prophet. You know, he like uh, in um, Surah 66 when he says, oh, prophet, why do you uh, make haram what Allah has made halal for you? Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, speaking about that situation, he, he, he addresses him as a prophet, not mm-hmm. as a messenger. So that's um, a distinction that they make. So in my opinion, uh, which I have, I, I posted a video about this and I shared some of my um thoughts and verses from the Quran about this topic, I think it all comes down to as what did the messenger, peace be upon him, actually receive? Did he only receive this Quran or did he receive something else from Allah besides the Quran? And this is where you get into the airtight, Mm -hmm. irrefutable arguments that if anyone out there is listening and knows one of these people and needs to discuss it, what the evidences that Jake is about to give are the ones that they don't really have an answer to. So he should go straight to them. Right. Because now when we say obey the messenger and they retort, well, the message that, message that he received was only the Quran. Now that's a conflict because if we prove that he received something else, then your understanding of that phrase obey Allah and obey the messenger is no longer valid. Mm-hmm. So what the messenger and I think... Sunnis, we can even agree with this, that what he, peace be upon him, actually received is linked to his authority. Mm -hmm. Because let's say for the sake of argument that he only received the Quran. He didn't receive any other type of wahi or inspiration from Allah. Then we could say, well, yeah, then we follow him in what he received. Mm -hmm. Um, Because even in Hadith, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, that uh, I think there was a situation where there was a battle and the prophet was coming up with a strategy for a battle. And one of the companions, I guess, was thinking to himself, well, maybe there's a better way that we could do this. I'm paraphrasing. And um, so he asked the prophet, he said, well, is this from Allah? Is this Wahi? Mm -hmm. And he said, no. And then he said, okay, well, here's what I think we should do. Mm -hmm. So... Even Sunnis accept that not every single thing that he said and did was wahi necessarily, Mm -hmm. right? So they make that distinction, and even the hadith in that example was trying to that, yes, we're going to follow you in what is from Allah, but if you're, you know, making up your own kind of thing that's not related necessarily to the deen in that sense, then it's not, it's subject to criticism Mm -hmm. in, in some sense. So, but if we prove that he received more than the Quran, then that means that you're obligated to follow that. If he received other than the Quran from Allah, then you're obligated to follow that. So Quranists, uh, Quran alone, whatever they want to call themselves, they, uh, for the most part, believe that the messenger only received the Quran and therefore that is what he has to be obeyed in. Mm. So now we're going to look at the Quran itself to see if it agrees with that or not. Okay. Okay. So in uh, Surah Baqarah, uh, Ayah 143, it says, And thus we have made you an exalted nation, that you may be the bearers of witness to the people, and that the messenger may be a bearer of witness to you. And we did not make the, that which you would have uh, had to be the Qibla, but that we might distinguish him who follows the messenger from him who turns back on his heels. And it is not indeed a hard test except for those whom Allah has guided, nor was Allah going to make your faith to be fruitless. Surely Allah is compassionate, merciful to the people. Mm. And then in the next verse, Allah mentions now 
I'm going to uh, give you a new Qibla because he's looking for a new Qibla. It says, uh, we see the turning of your face to the heaven, so we shall surely make thee master of the Qibla which thou likest. Turn then thy face towards uh, al-Masjid al-Haram, the sacred mosque. So the point is that uh, in, in verse 143, it's clearly stating that the messenger and those with him, there was a community with him, that were on a previous Qibla before al-Masjid al-Haram. I don't want to get bogged down too much into what it is. You know, we understand it as uh, Masjid al-Aqsa, right? Mm -hmm. But for the sake of argument, let's leave it open for them to say, okay, we don't know what the other Qibla was. Do you guys know what it is? They have no answer to knowing what the other uh, Qibla was. Mm -hmm. Now, if the messenger, because it's not mentioned in the Quran... If the messenger, peace be upon him, was only following the Qur'an, mm. then show me a verse in the Qur'an where he was commanded to originally follow that first Qibla. You can't find it. The verse just assumes that the reader already knows about this phenomenon, that the messenger and his companions were following this previous uh, Qibla. Mm. Now, what? there's a couple options. Was he just haphazardly doing it on his own? Did he just make up his uh, Qibla was this an existing Qibla from some other generation the the Arabs or whatever Allah makes it clear that he is the one who ordained this uh, mm, this Qibla. Uh, Qibla himself then he states the purpose for why he originally made this uh, first Qibla and now the second one he says to distinguish who would who would follow the messenger and who would turn back mm. on his heels so he was a messenger at the time of the first uh, Qibla. So he wasn't astray. He wasn't making up his own kind of thing. So there's no way out of this now. The only way you can deal with this is to say that the messenger had to receive something else besides the Quran in order for him to be following this first Qibla. Yeah. And he wasn't even just following it by himself. He was commanding others to do so because they were following him on it. Did you present this to anyone? Yes, yeah, so I uh, presented it uh, actually last week. I met up with some, uh, uh, on Sunday actually, some Quran-only group that I used to uh, regularly attend. And um, it was about four or five of us. I presented this and some other verses basically proving the same principle. Uh, verses showing that the only way um, the Prophet could have had certain information is if he received wahi apart from the Quran. And um, uh, one of the brothers actually, uh, who's a friend of mine, he actually accepted it and said, yeah, there's no way out of this box now. Mm -hmm. this, is, this is what it is. Mm -hmm. Now, I mean, I'm still kind of stringing him along as to further making it. But the first step of what did the messenger actually receive? Was it the Quran and something else? He is accepting he received something else. Uh, two of the other guys were kind of just totally against it. And one brother was actually arguing with the other guy and saying, well, because what they, what, what this guy did is he retreated to saying, he, he tried to make the distinction between Wahi and Huda. Okay. Uh -huh. So to say that, well, he might've received some other revelation, but it's not guidance for us today. Right. And the other guy who's uh, also a Turkish brother. He was saying, well, look, no, all along this group was saying that the only thing he received was the Quran. Now you're saying, now that Jake is presenting this verse, you have to make a further distinction and say, well, no, maybe he received something else, but it's not for us today. So now that's the next step of proving, well, is it relevant for us today? Is it guidance for us mm. today? You know, but... Um, he was because the guy was claiming, well, no, we never made this claim. We never said that the messenger only received the Quran. Mm. I have documentation of video clips from Hamza Abdul Malik himself saying this. I have screenshots of him written on the thing. And the other guy was honest enough to say that, yes, this was the position. Now you're retreating to something else. Mm. Now, just for um, as a footnote, there are two Hamza Abdul Maliks. Mm -hmm. There's one. A uh, scholar from Tennessee. He's a young scholar. He's even younger than me. Uh, but he's a big scholar uh, of tafsir, of fiqh, 
and he, him and his family have a message so that nobody thinks we're talking about that Hamza Abdul Malik. No, we this don't want to put him in yeah. that same category. Yeah, the, your Hamza Abdul Malik is an older gentleman <laughs> who studied with Ahmed Didat, mm-hmm. and he's uh, in a total different world. Right, definitely. Okay, Hamza, you yeah, got to I have me. a question. Why are they opposed to the possibility that the Prophet ﷺ would act capriciously or on his own and have a qibla that he wasn't divinely inspired to follow? Um, why would they? Well, because originally when I first presented it, some people would try to use that as an argument to say, well, maybe what he was just following some guidance from the Torah or the Injil and some remnants or something like that. But what I made clear is that the verse calls him the messenger several times in the verse, you see, and it says that Allah is the one who made this Qibla and then states his purpose. So I think um, trying to use that as an excuse of saying, well, the messenger was just kind of making something up. It wouldn't make sense of the verse itself when Allah is saying, well, we wanted to see who was going to follow the messenger from one Qibla to the other. Mm. If he didn't have authority in the first place to be um, proclaiming to the people to be on that first uh, Qibla, it wouldn't make any sense because it would be like, well, then what's the point of even the necessity of having to follow him on the first one to the second one? It wouldn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. So this is going to be the what's the verse number? Uh, chapter 2, verse 143 and 144. All right, so this is, I like these little uh, quick uh, ones that are, you know, irrefutable. Right. And this is something that's that's irrefutable. All the other stuff, I'm telling you, they're going to take you in circles and circles and circles. Mm-hmm. And Jake and I were on the car, we were in the car going to do the udhiyah, mm-hmm. to do the slaughter. And we talked about all these things. And I was like, well, what about this? Uh, he got an answer for that. What mm-hmm. about that? Uh, he got an answer. But this is the one that they really have no answer to. Right. As far as I can tell, uh, and I posted a video about this, I released it to the these uh, Quran alone community. Yeah. I've had a discussion with it about it. As a matter of fact, Hamza Abdul Malik refuses to uh, speak to up. me about it. Wow. He didn't even come to the gathering that we had, refuses to return my calls. Mm. And I've reached out to him uh, in a respectful way. He refuses to even discuss it with me. I asked at the beginning of this conversation with the with the other uh, guys who were there. I asked a simple question: What is Al Masjid Al Haram? Yeah. Now, you know, because you're you're stuck on this first uh, Qibla thing, all right? What is the new one now? Because now it's relevant for us today. Allah repeats it three mm. times in Surah Baqarah for us to be facing it now today. Yeah. So what is it? All four of them said, we don't know what it is. They're going to have to use outside of Quranic right. reference. So now that's even problematic for yourself because now you have commands in the Quran about Masjid al-Haram relating to specifically to ritual Salah, Hajj, that you can't make sense of any of those verses now and you can't fulfill the obligations and commands from Allah that are upon you regarding that. Allah is telling you to turn your face towards it wherever you are. You can't do it. Because you don't know what yeah. it is. <laughs> well, what if we go even deeper and say, well, where do we get the meanings of words from? Right. We have to rely on an outside source. <laughs> like, well, I mean, how do they answer that? Uh, right. So, uh, which I mentioned to you in the past, they have this idea of um, that the Quran it, uh, Defines it, itself. basically explains itself. Mm. And um, because the Quran is referred to, I think, in chapter 25, verse 33, as the best tafsir mm. of, the, of, of a tafsir of itself. So in some sense, it's true. Um, and what they would use is they would look up, for example, if we were talking about wahi, they would look up uh, how many times it's used, the different forms that it's used, and read all the v- related verses to get an understanding of it is, of what it is. And um, that's a proper method in some sense. But what do you do with the verses or the words that are only used one time in the Quran? And if you're not an, a native Arab speaker, yeah. especially the Arabic of the Quran, you might have no idea what it means. Like in uh, Surah uh, Ikhlas, it says, Allahu Samad. That's the only time that that word Samad is used in the whole Quran. So how do you know what it means? Mm. The only way you're going to know what it means is if somebody who does know what it means is translating it for you or if you go to an outside source like a lexicon or dictionary or whatever. So they're stuck. You're, they have to use it. Yeah, you're stuck with that. So if you, if you take such a literal, hard-line understanding of Quran alone and what it means, yeah. then, yeah, you're, you're, you're jammed on that. 
Uh, but I think they would just say, well, in terms of our guidance and so on, um, it's it's not uh, related to that. But, of course, it's problematic. Uh, f- secondly, there are words that mean one ha- – the same word has one meaning in one verse and a completely other meaning in another verse, mm-hmm. right? Right. And, w- and that's another thing we discussed. Right. Right. So they – and I, and I don't want to say all of them, but at least the group that I was a part of, they have a presupposition, an assumption, that if Allah uses an Arabic word in the Quran, that it's going to have basically the same, anything that derives from that root is going to have the same general uh, meaning throughout the whole Quran. So, for example, uh, I, at this point I should mention that generally there's two main groups of Quran alone Muslims. Some that make rituals the way that Sunnis do. They do a ritual prayer, Salah. They believe in pilgrimage to Mecca, which mm. is Hajj. And these sort of things, uh, Siam, fa- fasting in the month of Ramadan. Then you have another group who uh, basically doesn't believe in any of that. So they basically redefine those terms to mean something else and to get out of the problem of doing any of these rituals. And um, so the reason I bring that up is one of the arguments that the people use for not uh, believing that Salah is a ritual prayer is that Allah makes Salah. Okay. He makes Salah on a prophet. Mm-hmm. And this is actually an argument that's used by Christians. I don't know if you saw this whole thing going on with uh, Muhammad Hijab. It was big. Um, and uh, so they say, well, if Salah means pray, then Allah is, uh, Allah is praying on the prophet. Right. And Allah makes Salah even on the believers in mm. general. So they say, well, if Salah means prayer in these other verses, we have to apply that same understanding and meaning of this. And then you basically wound up with shirk. Mm. <laughs> so um, that's an argument that they would use. And um, it's easily it's easy to refute because they do it for their own agenda when it comes to a topic like Salah. But what do you do about uh, the verses that mention, like, um, body parts that Allah has? Mm. When it says that Allah has a face, mm. right? Or Allah has hands. You know, now if you take that literally, because in other verses, it clearly does mean that he that um, the word means face like and hands. Like the verse of wudu. Right, yeah. right. It's clearly referring to that. But now, Based on the principle of Laysa uh, Kamithli Hishe, we know that nothing's like a law, so we can't interpret that to mean literally that he has a face like you and me sitting here, right? So when you read when you read that, what do they do? Do they say that a law has a face? Well, no, they they, they don't say that he has yeah. a face in that sense. So you're you're not applying that principle that you're saying is a Quranic principle. When it gets down to it, you're not applying it across the board because if you do, you wind up with absurdities and contradictions. So how do they end up? What kind of meaning do they find for the word Salah? Um, so this group, uh, they would say that basically Salah is um, your duty or um, uh, turning towards. And um, the primary verse that they give for that is in uh, chapter 75, I think it is. But it can't be duty. Allah doesn't have a duty towards us, right? And it, Allah right. makes Allah upon right. us so, in the Quran. So, so even, even, in that, even in that verse itself about Salah, they would translate it as something like support. or Because, um, I, know, I mean, I know there's been, even among Sunnis, where does the root word Salah actually come from? There's some disagreements about that, right? Uh, but one of the theories is that it comes from connection, the mm-hmm. word that means connection. So they would understand it as that, like links in a chain, right? That you, you're turning towards a law. And um, we would even accept that because in prayer, that's what you're doing, right? Yeah. But they, they would understand it as turning towards a law in the sense of following his commands closely and not, uh, and not going against that, basically. So it's interesting that the wudu is spe- uh, specified in the Quran, yes. right? And salah is now determined to be following commands, right? So that means every time you need to follow a command, you're going to make wudu, <laughs> right? Yeah. So uh, what they would say is that the salah at the time of the Prophet, peace be upon him, was related to 
uh, because the Quran was a new revelation, right? And mm. the people didn't have access to it. It wasn't written on paper like we have it now in the book. Um, he, the Prophet would have these basically Quran recitation meetings where he would recite and rehearse the revelation with the people. So they would have to come at certain times during the day, as the Quran mentions, and they would have to come and listen to them. So that's why it was um, time relative at that time. Um, but for us now today, it, it's not relative. Hmm. Yeah. Hamza, what do you got? I mean, I'm just, I'm just thinking that based on like this conversation, then even a translation of the Quran would be unacceptable because by nature in a translation, unless you're translating word for word in the order that it is, there is some level of human interpretation coming in Right, because the translator is is understanding what the verse says, and then giving you his interp- that interpretation in English. Definitely. Right? Yeah. So if we're going to accept that, how are we going to reject the prophet's interpretation of what the Quran says, mm-hmm. which yeah. is what we interpret the life of the prophet as? Yeah. Right. I mean, even commonsensically, every document has interpretation. Like the Constitution doesn't have interpretation. Yeah. Right. It has interpretation. Right. Like, uh, I mean, if they wrote an article. We would interpret it. Right. Others would interpret it. So, mm-hmm. I mean, th- so they're basically denying interpretation, period. Right? <laughs> In a sense, yeah. W- well, what they would say is that you have what the text actually says and means. Yeah. And then what the interpretation is. And your interpretation is only correct insofar as it accurately represents what the text says. So, who actually can judge that is, is a problem. Yeah. And there, you, you mentioned something about the personality of this type of, uh, of, in, uh, of, of the members of these groups mm-hmm. is that they tend to be sort of arrogant people who are not really caring about what anyone else thinks. They're isolationist types, mm-hmm. right? Right. Uh, I hate to use the term loners, but a lot of them are not really um, in the community. They don't like, for example, if, if we say, well... This this sort of idea, what does it lead to? You you can't create a community with it, and yeah. and so on. You're the you're the minority. You're not in the majority of the Muslims. They don't care. They'll use certain verses to justify um, that. Uh, for example, that every time that Allah uses the term "most" in the Quran, it's always used negatively. Mm-hmm. You know, most people don't serve Allah alone without uh, shirk. You mm-hmm. know, all these kind of things. Most people hate the truth. All these, all these negative uh, applications of most people, and so they're not, they don't really care about most people. And me, uh, looking back on it uh, from a psychoanalytical view, why did I care? My, I'm a convert. My whole family is not Muslims. Mm. So what, what community and, and sense was I going to have with them? Mm-hmm. You know, and I've always uh, been a rebellious person in general. I don't mm. really care what other people think. I don't care. I, if I think I'm correct, I don't care if I'm one out of a million. You actually fit in very well in the Safina Society podcast. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Yeah. So um, I, I couldn't care less. And I think that, which may be a good quality at times, um, but could get you into trouble like in this situation other times. And the, a large majority of the people, at least in my opinion, have this personality trait of kind of going against the grain and not necessarily caring about what place they are in in terms of majority and minority. See, the thing is that uh, we actually take the exact opposite view of the Jama'ah. In Ahl Sunnah, if you're not in good terms, on good terms with the Jama'ah of Muslims, then there's something wrong, right? I mean, very rarely is the whole Jama'ah going to be off the mark on something and if that's the case then it, it would be maybe in one city or one region you're never going to have the whole ummah completely off the mark so the idea of separation from the jama'ah is really the limit for us the person could be as cavalier as they want and everything they want to do but when it comes to basic doctrine theology prayer and unity and attending of masajid that's actually a sign of misguidance when a person is off the a weight has no connection has no group etc right and we t- we spoke about uh masjid al haram and what it is they don't know what it is because they don't really have a concept of what 
mashed it is. Mm. So they don't believe, at least in terms of this group, uh, what they don't believe that it's a physical place, a physical building where you go and, and serve God and meet with the community and so on. Yeah. So they, they're just sitting at their house. They don't really care about that. Now, the ones who do make uh, Salah as a ritual prayer, they do have this, like you, you brought up the website, it's called uh, Masjid Tucson. Yeah. They have their own mosque. Yeah. You know, so they at least attempted to build some kind of community. Now, their leader was killed, so how successful was it? But they at least attempted to do that. Do know? they pray Eid, these guys? Um, like those, the followers of uh, Khalifa? I'm not really sure. Because, I, I mean, Eid is not in the Quran. Yeah, I, I really I really don't know. I'm not All sure. right, let's, let's look at their practices. Religious duties. They got the five pillars here. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, religious, how to perform the contact prayers. What is he talking about, the contact yeah, prayers? Yeah, so they, they call the Salah contact prayers, meaning basically you're contacting God, your connection with God. Okay. That's how they translate it. I mean, it sounds a little bit weird. Okay, that's interesting. I mean, so they have the Adhan, mm-hmm. which they have their own Adhan. Which is different. Many years later, people added to Muhammad's name to the event. All right, these people. Oh yeah, are, that's uh, another big s- thing that we should probably touch on. Yeah, um, is that the shahada, uh-huh. right? Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ahdahu la sharika la wa ashhadu an Muhammad Rasulullah. Yeah, they don't believe in adding Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah with Ashhadu an Muhammad Rasulullah. Okay. These two things cannot be added together. If you do this, you become a mushrik. Okay? Because they believe. And uh, one of the verses, and this is a, going back to the principle of, of how we understand how the word usage in the Quran actually is. Uh-huh. They say that in, I think it's chapter 13, verse 43, that Allah is sufficient as a witness. Right? A law uh-huh. is sufficient as a witness between you and me because there were people who were coming to the messenger saying, you're not a messenger. Mm-hmm. And the verse says to answer them and saying, a law is sufficient as a witness between me and you. Mm-hmm. Right. So their claim is somebody else doesn't need to. Co- Jake doesn't need to come along and bear witness to the messengership of of the prophet. Right. Uh-huh. Because if I do. Yeah. Then they think that I'm taking that verse and I'm calling a law a liar because is he sufficient or is he not, mm. right? In the same sense that you had a similar argument from the uh, Khawarij, yeah. where they said that the judgment is a law alone. The judgment is only for a law, right? Yeah. They, they had this idea. And in some sense, there's some truth to that statement. But they, they didn't differentiate between uh, what it should be actually applied to and what it isn't. And, for example, we have other verses in the Quran that talk about uh, when you do a contract, you should have two witnesses. Mm-hmm. So now, wait, what are you saying? Is Allah contradicting himself? He said he was sufficient as a witness. Good now point. he's telling you to get two witnesses when you yeah. make a contract. So what, they say so about what that? is it? Yeah. You, you, you're, you're lost <laughs> now. So when you, when you have such a literalist understanding of certain verses mm. and you can't, uh, differentiate between context. Yeah, you're gonna wind up making a law look like a fool, <laughs> you know. Which <laughs> the law, it's yeah. it's, it's just, contradictory. It becomes yeah. nonsense. It's just a mismatch of information. Yeah. You just like uh, I said before, you apply the principle when you want. Then when Jake comes along and says, "Okay, this is your principle. Let's apply it to this." Mm-hmm. Now you have no answer. It's interesting that how you put them in the category of, of literalists, whereas most people put them in the category of modernists, mm-hmm. right? But I think literalists is actually a better uh, uh, grouping because this is actually what the methodology that they're applying is. Yeah, in this, right? in this sense, in, yeah. in, in that, those topics that I just brought up, yeah. they're taking a rigid, literal understanding of that verse of and then they're word. just trying to apply it to every single mention of it. Yeah. Yeah. So now, when you got out of this thing, was it difficult? Or did they give you a hard time? Did they come after you? Did they not care? Do, or did you have a connection with this Sam Jaron? Ca- no, character? I, I had no connection with him. And uh, even when I was involved with it, a lot of his stuff was just totally out there. He was uh, interested in um, 
uh, conspiracy theories and the earth is flat and we never went to the moon and all these other kind of things. Oh, so he's into, so he's like, you know, into that stuff. Uh, what's the guy's name? Uh, Alex Jones. Yeah. 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 And <laughs> whether they're true or not, me personally, I don't, I don't believe in those conspiracy th- theories, but whether they're true or not, I personally, I don't care. Yeah. I'm not interested in it at all. Yeah. You know, whether the earth is flat or round, I don't care at all. It yeah. means absolutely nothing to me. So I was never interested in it uh, personally. Um, but as far as the group that I was affiliated with, which was uh, Hamza Abdul Malik and uh, some of the other people there, um, they are totally against what I'm saying, except for the one guy who um, is completely rejecting the Quran alone concept now. Um, and like I said, he invited one of the brothers invited me to his house. We had a discussion about it. It got heated, went back and forth, but at the end of the day, we gave slams, and that's it. We're fine, and I still talked to him. I was on the phone with him the other day, Uh, so there's no problem as far as that goes, Um, but the ringleader, unfortunately, wants nothing to do with me, Mm. and me personally, I think it's because he can't deal with the argument, you know, so. Now, one of the things Moeen said is that really what we need to also mention in this episode is the importance of the Quran. Right. Because we're in a world now that you do have Quran only as an attempt to actually sidestep Hadith. And once you sidestep that, you get you, you the, 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 the ego rids itself of a lot of things that have it would have to do or believe or mm-hmm. or, or know or act upon or right. not do. Right. But then it's sort of a bait and switch, because as soon as you do that, you can now all you have is one source left. And if that source gets minimized, now you have nothing except your desires, right. right? Your women desires. So the Quran itself, one of the things that came up recently is, is every verse in the Quran have to be believed in as mm-hmm. it is, mm-hmm. right? And the answer to that is on its face value and its literal sense, the answer mm-hmm. to that is yes, until it contradicts with another verse, mm-hmm. right? Or it contradicts with observable evidence. Right. It's like something that you actually are witnessing right in front of your own two eyes. Mm -hmm. So those are the only two conditions. So that where they call this a Dariru Shar'i and then Al Hissi. And then the last one is Al Aqli, Mm -hmm. a rational Mm -hmm. uh, purpose such that two opposing things cannot be the same thing. Right. Very simple, you know, rule of logic. So when the Quran, uh, uh, when we have verses, we do actually have to take them literally except in these three situations, Mm -hmm. right? These uh, three situations. So, for example, your, what the examples that you gave of the witnesses, Mm -hmm. that would be an example of that the, the, the first verse in which Allah says, is not Allah sufficient as a witness, Mm -hmm. cannot be taken to expand upon everything else. Right. Right. Because in, contracts he commands witnesses right right so uh these are the three times other than that uh, uh, or the three circumstances other than that a muslim is obligated right to accept everything the quran brings and that at least from what i know from our teachers and this is the dominant opinion right and uh from i from every ashari scholar that i've ever heard right has, has stated the denial of an explicit verse of quran is kufr, mm-hmm. right? You cannot deny an explicit verse, mm-hmm. a verse the language of which can only be one way, mm-hmm. or is very clear mm-hmm. in its usage and its, its the verbiage and language. Mm-hmm. So uh, now that's on the doctrinal point. The other point is the Quran in people's lives. So we could take a turn here and look at the Quran in daily life. So I, when I look at, think of Quranists, I think of argumentation. Mm-hmm. More so than do they memorize the book? Do they recite it every day? Mm-hmm. Are they p- those types of people whose masahif are tattered and they have to buy new ones every year? Mm-hmm. Right? Are they people? Who, are they of those types? I remember sh- uh, it was um, went up to Boston back in the day when I was living in Connecticut and working uh, in the colleges there. That we went up to Hamza Bushi. Sheikh Hamza Bushishi had some followers up in Connecticut, so we went to visit uh, Boston. Went to visit them. One of them said that Hamza Bushishi's grandson was literally always holding a Quran and that he was overseeing construction who was reciting a Quran, mm-hmm. right? So he was literate. So the Quran is permeated in his, his daily life and his daily recitation 
I'm not seeing that from these guys, right? Mm -hmm. You want to be a Quranist in beliefs only or in practice too, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, I would say um, specifically the group that I was with, they were very much about studying the Quran, you know? Um, just how, about, how about recitation, learning Tajweed and things no, like no, that? No, 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 no. That, that's all. <laughs> they don't care about that. I, I'm just saying as far as studying it for argumentation, yeah. you know? So they, they can do like what I'm doing now. I'm just rattling off verses that I have memorized from the top of my head that even most Sunnis can't do. Yeah. You know what I mean? Which is because they're more concerned with reciting the Quran properly, memorizing it, and these different things, which is good also, um, of course. Um, but these people, because most of them, at least in the group that I was, they're not Arabs. They don't mm. speak Arabic. Most of them are not fluent in reading Arabic, right? And uh, because of that, they're mostly concerned with the English, what the English says. They, yeah. check the, they check the Arabic and see the different translations and so on. But be, especially them, who are, they're not reciting Quran in prayer every day, five times a day. Yeah. They're not concerned with that at all. They're checking it for arguments against Christians, against Sunnis, against yeah. all these different groups to just bash these people down. That's what, the, and I would. I mean, I was a part of it too. I would, I would never be sitting at this table with you guys now without without calling you a mushrik, kafir, <laughs> all these kind of things. Yeah, it's it's serious. And how many years were you on this thing? Uh, about eight years. Eight years. Yeah. And you had a YouTube channel. Yeah, I did. And did I, yep. I, I took a lot of the videos down. I still have some up uh, that are not unrelated to this topic. What's the name of the channel? It's called the Criterion. And you had a lot of, uh, was it active? Uh, yeah, I got about, about 500 views for each video or so. That's, not, that's good. Yeah, I mean, I'm a I nobody mean. from New Jersey, so <laughs> <laughs> it's not bad. But now I'm sure if you search it now, you won't see any of my videos because I put them all private. Yeah. Um, and that's for another reason. But um, yeah, so um, generally speaking, I had about 500 views per video. And um, a lot of Quranists were like, uh, following me and you know and did they hoorah. go did they go <laughs> after you after that uh, yeah they went after me they I, I actually deleted my Facebook account because they and, went after you. and created a new Facebook account not so it was kind of preemptive to be honest because I knew it was gonna come so I just I put the video <coughs> out I said look this is my this I changed my view on this yeah. I'm no longer crawl alone because I think it's completely indefensible mm-hmm I said, I'll be coming out with a new video about this next week, inshallah. I put the video out, said, here's the video. You guys could do what you want. I don't have time to be going back and forth with you all day long on this Facebook stuff. Yeah. I have a job. <laughs> I'm not doing this. You know? And I said, I'm going to be creating a new Facebook account one week from now. Anybody who wants to add me there can do so. If you don't, so be it. I did. <laughs> now I have less than 100 friends. <laughs> Before, I had over 3,000. Wow. Yeah. That's crazy. <laughs> I didn't know they were, like, that violent about it. They're serious, man. I, I don't know yeah. about if they get violent, but... Not violent like so, that. So serious the, that yeah. you're a mushrik, you're a kafir, all this kind of stuff. I used to go, which I mentioned to you, I used to go to Journal Square in yeah. Jersey City. And where the people were... Which is, um, as you know, a lot, most of New Jersey, a lot of Muslims are Salafi, yeah. and especially in the Dawah scene. Um, I was a part of the M MSA at my college. Which, and these, which college was that? Uh, NJCU, New Jersey City University. So um, in Jersey City, every week on the weekends, on Saturdays, these Salafi brothers would go and give Dawah out yeah. in Journal Square, which is a very popular area. I used to show up there to give Dawah to them. When they would be trying to give Dawah to other people, yeah. Christians, I thought I was giving Dawah to them. Yeah. You know, I would wow. be arguing with these guys. And actually, the one guy um, who was uh, basically heading the ta the Dawah table there, I told him uh, when, I, when I got out of this Quran alone stuff, I messaged him on Facebook and said, look, I'm, you know, I'm done with all this stuff. I, to I briefly told him why, and I said... I'm looking uh, to uh, start studying with a Maliki Fiqh teacher yeah. around here. I said, do you know anybody? He said, look, I'm going to get back to you. He came back to me, and he mentioned you. 
Yeah. And so that's how I came to MBIC, and the rest is history. <laughs> About three months ago or so. Yeah. Subhanallah. Yep. That's crazy. I mean, Hamza, what you you saw? You got this stuff in your MSA? Not really. Um, I've I personally haven't come across Quran only people in my in my own life besides the extent of what I did mention. Yeah. Um, I think you see more of it online. Yeah. Was the people that you dealt with were they online or do you know anybody no, personally in, that you talked to in person? Oh, okay. In person, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but like that's mostly like they're not really. So like, serious? About yeah, it? they're not serious about it. They're not like the way you're reciting verse out They yeah. they don't even read the Quran themselves. Right. They've just heard the talking points and be like, okay, yeah, I'm gonna do this. Show right. me more in the Quran. And says I can't. Right. Yeah. And then you're just like, all right. See, yeah, I, I, there was a guy in England yeah. who had this right, mm-hmm. and I was friends with a. I was friends with a, a guy. Uh, his wife. Okay. In England, we are all alone, so they would invite us for Eid. So I got to know this family. Now his wife had uh, a set of sisters. And their dad was this guy, Quran only, right? So no rejecter. Mm-hmm. But the thing is that I really believe this was his punishment in this life. He had one son-in-law who was a Sufi. One son-in-law who was Hizb tahrir Like hardcore, not flu- lukewarm, like hardcore. One son-in-law who was jihadist. <laughs> <right>? <laughs> and one son-in-law who was part of some other group. England's a crazy place, man. It's a crazy place, right? <laughs> but what are the chances that all of the daughters end up marrying these hardcore guys? So I would go for Eid dinners there, and it would be just debate central. Like a battle. <laughs> it's a battle, right? It was a battle. And the, the one Sufi uh, gentleman, he would go off on the side, mm-hmm. being a proper Sufi, <laughs> right? And avoid it all. And the Hizb Tahrir guy, the jihadi guy, and me... We would go at it, right? Because <laughs> I'm not going to back down. Yeah. And I never like to make fit in, uh, with people. Uh, I don't ever like to make any disruption. Mm-hmm. But when it's something explicit in the religion, mm-hmm. right? Like something there's no doubt about it. Every single Ahl Sunnah or Jama'ah, mm-hmm. uh, Madhab or group or scholar will recognize, mm-hmm. right? Uh, then it's worth it, mm-hmm. right? Then it's something major. If you look at the Prophet, peace be upon him, was, uh, if you look at him, it's such a, so mellow, but there was, something that was worthy of war, mm-hmm. which is Tawheed, right. right? So the major things are worthy, are worthy of war. Right. And when you have that attitude that only these major red lines, this is worthy of war, mm-hmm. right? And any friction that results will be good in the long run. Mm-hmm. It won't be negative. It will be good in the long run mm-hmm. because you're protecting something valuable. So that's the attitude to go. So we, I went at it with this jihad guy. The Hizb tahrir folks, it was not much of a thing except that they I, f- I personally found I've never ever found an HT except it's an argument it's gonna it's gonna be argumentation like I've never found constructive work I just found argumentation mm-hmm. I mean maybe there are groups out there that I didn't see but that's what I saw mm-hmm. all it is and there is like you said this group is argumentation constant right. and the Prophet Sallallahu has a hadith mm-hmm. which he says ma dalla qawmun ba'd al huda like there is not a single people that had guidance and left it off except that they were given argumentation mm-hmm. and if you think about how many things in the deen that cannot exist that you need it cannot exist if you're an argumentative person that loves fitna and friction mm-hmm. like sometimes like last episode we talked about how sometimes you need action you need energy you would want to get your energy out if you really want to fight fights on something that's worthwhile Right, something that is direct, directly related to the obligations of our belief and practice, not on something that's debatable, and not on something that's about a person. Right, there's never a point. Right, in that. Yeah. And I don't know about you, but me personally, <laughs> it's just my personality that when I'm when I you could be like tired and you don't feel like doing mm-hmm. something, but yeah. when you get ready to start refuting somebody, all of a sudden you get all kind That's of true. energy. You could stay up it's all shaitanic. night long yeah. and and just start yeah. driving into somebody. You it's know? a shaitanic energy. Yeah. And the and the thing is that uh, the 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 things that you cannot keep up if you're an argumentative person is a good marriage, right? Because you can't be argumentative in one field and a nice guy in another because this is a character trait. And character traits cannot be turned on and off, right? right? You cannot be a community member. You can't coexist 
if you're argumentative, like you, you go to Masajid, for example, the Masjid doesn't belong to you. It's for everyone, right? Mm-hmm. So therefore, everyone's going to have a say in how things go, mm-hmm. right? Uh, you can't be a good anything. You're not going to be a good dad if you're argumentative. So all these things, the argumentative personality, you, you have to control it or change it. Mm-hmm. And all these groups, they, pr- they pull that out of a person. Mm-hmm. And uh, I pr- I, from what I saw, a lot of the families of these people were so miserable, mm-hmm. right? Because it was always an argument. It's always jidad. And jidad argumentation, mm-hmm. it's physically bad for you. Yeah, like definitely. Your nerves won't accept it after a while. Oh, yeah. Now, that guy, I'm just curious, was he, how did he become, a, the, the guy from England, how yeah. did he become a Quranist or like, how was he? There was a circle of elite Pakistanis mm-hmm. where this ori- sort of originated, I guess. Mm-hmm. It originated in Pakistan. Yeah. Or it was India. Yeah, there was a big was time um, Quranist from there. I yeah. forget his name. From Pakistan. Yeah. yeah. It was there. It went to Egypt. The Egyptian mm-hmm. scholars flushed it out real quick, flushed mm-hmm. it down the toilet real quick. There was easy, even one guy from uh, Al Azhar. Yeah. He was a graduate and he. He was, he, I think he's still alive, actually. I'm oh, not what's sure. his name? I don't know. I'd have to look him up. But he was heavily promoting this stuff. Yeah. Yep. And they're, uh, they, they fought it in Syria. Likewise, the, it was very hard to push it with the Arabs, right? Mm-hmm. It's very hard to push it. Because mm-hmm. Sira, stories of Sahaba, it's sort of so ingrained. It's, in, it's everywhere, mm-hmm. right? But amongst the Ajam, mm-hmm. amongst the, the, you said the Turks, there was there. Amongst the Persians. I mean, the, uh, the, in Pakistan, it was very popular. But now it's seeping back into the... Uh, now that education is lower in places like Egypt, it's seeping back in. Oh, really? Yeah, it's seeping yeah. back in. And definitely, I would say, with people in uh, places like England and America, yeah, I think it's becoming increasingly more popular. It's popular because it's a way to, to, to achieve what you want to achieve. Mm-hmm. I mean, if you admit hadith, there are a lot of things that become haram. Mm-hmm. Right, and there a lot of things become fud, and not only just they become oblig- obligatory, how to do them properly becomes obligatory. Mm-hmm. Right? So, like, besides that, and besides the rebellious nature of it that you mm-hmm. talked about, mm-hmm. what appeals, like, what about it appeals to other people? You know, like you were like you were coming from like a Catholic background. You said so you didn't grow up with a lot of the restrictions that I guess Muslim kids might grow up with, right? Mm-hmm. So, maybe that was a lesser part of it for you, or like in general, like what do people find? about it that draws them into it um well like the people that you said you came in contact with a lot of them were not kind of on this argument thing um so it's hard for me to say because that's the majority of people that i was around and uh that's the personality trait that i saw uh but i'm assuming for the other people who are not so heavily into it like know the arguments ins and outs and try to prove you wrong and so on i guess it's because they don't want to follow all these other hadith that are telling them to do xyz maybe especially in the west it might make their life more complicated Uh i don't know Allah knows best what's in their you know what their intention is as as far as that goes Mm. all right any what else we got hums anything else no, I mean, it's... Mm. Okay. Yeah, I just want to add one last thing because I feel like we've, we spent a lot of time talking about the uh, the groups who don't believe in the rituals and so on um, and, you know, what kind of a proof against them is. Uh, obviously, what I mentioned about Masjid al-Haram, it also applies to the people, the Quranists, who think that Salah is a ritual prayer. But I think there's a large portion of them who do make these rituals, but... What can we say about them? What's the problem with them? Problem with them is is that one of the main pillars of their principle is that the Quran is fully detailed, as I gave from the verse, right? Now, we know that the Quran tells you to make salah, tells you to do the prayer. It may, mentions a few prayer times, but it doesn't detail the prayer from Allahu Akbar to the salam, yeah. right? So how are these Quranists, and you brought up um, their website, the guy, Rashad Khalifa, I think he actually still has on YouTube, you can watch him demonstrating the prayer. So what I would say about these people, I would press them on where are the details of all the things that you're doing in your prayer. Mm. Where in the Quran does it say, begin your salah by raising your hands and saying Allahu Akbar? Mm. Nowhere. It's nowhere there. Mm Mm-hmm. 
how many rakats are, are, do you perform for each prayer? Mm-hmm. It's not in the Quran. Yeah. So you are getting this stuff from a Sunni source, which mainly comes from hadith, mm-hmm. yet you're rejecting hadith. Yeah. So you're claiming the Quran is fully detailed, yet you're doing things in regards to the deen, like your salah every day, yeah. that is not detailed in the Quran. So this is one of the reasons why I flat out rejected that because I said, that's complete nonsense. Yeah. There's only three options. Either Salah has to mean something else. Uh, the Sunni perspective is correct that we need something else to show these details, right? Mm-hmm. Or the Quran is just false, that it's claiming to be fully detailed and it's yeah, not. It? And I just reject the whole thing. Yeah. But I couldn't accept of saying... The Quran is fully detailed, and yet I'm doing something that I'm claiming the Quran says that doesn't have the details for yeah. it. It doesn't make sense. So that's the problem with these people. Did these did they ever use the hadith uh, and say, well, the Prophet himself said, don't write my hadith? Yeah, they, they would use that. That's an amateur is going to use that. Though. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's an amateur thing. <laughs> because you're using a hadith. Exactly. <laughs> and yeah. actually, Edip Yuxa does, and... Uh, Rashad Khalifa even used to when, when, we, when we talked about the Allah's name being mentioned a multiple of 19 and he actually rejected two verses in uh, Surah 9 128 and 129 he used the Hadith as evidence of that yeah. which I don't remember off the top of my head but it was somewhere along the lines that basically every verse in the Quran had to be substantiated by I think two witnesses mm. and supposedly there's a Hadith that says these two verses only yeah. were the only two verses that had were substantiated by one person. One Sahaba. One, yeah, one Sahaba. Yeah. So they were saying, this goes against that principle, yeah. right? And so that was some kind of proof to say that there's something fishy about these two verses. Yeah. So I always press back by saying, you're telling us to reject Hadith. Then you're using a hadith yeah, exactly, yeah. to show a Quranic principle yeah. that you think is true, which was nonsense it. anyway. Yeah. So. so this whole episode, in case anyone uh, comes across this, and I'm pretty sure at this, this rate, every family, every extended family, hopefully not every family, every extended family will have someone who's met someone, right? So this is your 90-minute uh, pill, right? Mm-hmm. And you got it. And I like to keep my dean simple, mm-hmm. right? And if something is true, mm-hmm. then its vaccine or its refutation should also be very simple, right? right? It should not be that complicated. Right. Because if something is true, then Allah has made it true for all people, right? Exactly. And therefore, it needs a very simple proof because not everyone is literate. Not everyone can go deep into things. So the, the idea of uh, when people say Islam is easy, yeah, Islam, there are some complicated elements in, in, in learning in uh, Islam, but the... Mm-hmm the necessities yeah the right? basics the basics are mm-hmm. very simple and this right. one verse that you gave her from surah al-baqarah right. about the qibla there's is no the one yeah. that there's no way around it if you ever deal with someone uh who's from this so again uh closing remarks i'll start with closing remarks then we can go around mm-hmm. people should keep their deen simple we should recite the quran daily stay away from fitan however if it's something that's essential in the deen Right, where your religion is being, its fundamentals being attacked, then you don't step back. It's like your kids being attacked, right? right. Other than that, halas, we should stay away from these fields of fitan uh, and drama, okay? Unless it's something that's from these fundamentals. But keep our deen simple by reciting at least, if we can recite Yasin every morning on the way to work, Allahu Akbar, right? If you can recite Quran daily, and if you can recite on the weekends longer, session with the book of Allah this is the uh, not an easy time and you need a lot of time with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because Allah ta'ala says ana jalisu man dhakarani which is i am i am the uh, the jalis is the one sitting with right i'm the sitting with i'm attending with the one who remembers me so make your gatherings of dhikr long on your weekends make that something that's definitely part of your day uh, daily even if it's less in the monday through friday but that to me is what the, these Quranists are totally missing. They actually don't recite the Quran, mm-hmm. which is just the irony of it. Right. So uh, that's my closing comment. Uh, Hamza, what you yeah, got? I just think it's really important, like Dr. Shadi, you were saying earlier, um, of staying close with the Jama'ah, with the congregation of people. Very important. Because even something like this, or even in general, like when you kind of step out a little bit, eventually you will regress back to the mean. 
Yeah. You know? And the and the jama'a is our, our thermometer, right? Or our barometer of knowing, have we gone too far, right? Have, has this thing affected us negatively? We're going to see it in the jama'a. We're going to see that people don't like to spend time with us. We're going to see that we no longer can sit in a masjid. Mm-hmm. And this has happened, and many scholars have written about this. The sign of a scholar that's lost his way is that he cannot go and just sit in a random mosque, right? right? Either you become too controversial, no one wants to talk to you, mm-hmm. right? Or you become too arrogated, or you just love the powerful, right? Mm-hmm. So these are, that's actually one of the biggest signs that if we be, can become old men and old women, right, and sit with our families without a problem, Mm-hmm. And go to the any masjid without a problem, right? This is a good sign. This is right. a sign that we've kept with our jama'at and, and Allah has instilled in us a love for the general Muslim ummah. Right. Yeah. Well, the last thing I want to say is uh, I just want to read one more verse uh, regarding the Quranists because some of them might claim, well, this other stuff that the messenger, peace be upon him, received, mm. it's not relevant for us. Like... When I asked them about what is Masjid al Haram, we don't know what it is. Mm. Um, in uh, chapter 3, verse 96, it says, Certainly the first house appointed for men is the one at Becca, blessed and a guidance for the nations, mm-hmm. right? It's Huda lil Alameen. Mm-hmm. It's for mankind. Mm. So for you to say that you don't know what it is, right? And Allah is telling you it's guidance for mankind. Mm -hmm. That's a contradiction. How could Allah give us something that's guidance for mankind and yet on your own principle of following Mm. only the Quran? You're telling me it's unknowable. How could it be guidance for mankind if it's unknowable? It makes absolutely no sense. So to say that it's not relevant to us is just ridiculous. Uh, The last thing I want to ask you... um, actually is what do you think is like what category uh do these people fall under are they kafir are they mushrik or what what would you say they are and what would their um fate with the law be if they maintain this belief uh until death uh well uh ibn abi zaid in madiki fiqh he's one of the early early mujtahid imams in the in the madhab so i'll i'll speak from his perspective that apostates are of two categories. A murtad and a zindiq. Mm-hmm. A murtad is someone who casts off the identity of Muslim. So there's no discussion about him. Mm-hmm. He doesn't want to be a Muslim. He's telling you I'm not a Muslim anymore. All right? That's the murtad, the apostate. Right. Then you have the zindiq. Mm-hmm. The zindiq is someone who he's telling you I'm a Muslim. Right. And he's telling you I'm practicing Islam. But mm-hmm. what he's practicing is clearly contradictory to... Uh, the Quran, mm-hmm. right? So explicit verses of the Quran or mutawatir facts in the ummah that mm-hmm. uh, the whole ummah knows, right? right? Or what we, to simply put in a simple formula, formula that which is known in religion by necessity. Mm-hmm. So al ma'lum min al-deen bil darura. So if if that's negated, okay, and uh, th- then there are zindiqs. They're not Muslims, mm-hmm. okay? They're claiming their claim to Islam doesn't make them Muslim. So mm-hmm. I can claim to be a Russian all I want. I can keep saying money, money, money doesn't make me rich, mm-hmm. right? And I can claim to be, um, you know, a Swedish citizen doesn't mean I'm a Swedish citizen, right? Mm-hmm. So if I don't have the right evidence or proof, so they uh, would be zindiqs. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they're, they're be consi- they won't even be considered innovators. Like mm-hmm. heretics are those who deny an explicit verse or hadith, mm-hmm. okay? An explicit verse or hadith without, uh, uh, and they deny it. But that's not mutawatir. It's not widespread. Mm-hmm. Okay, so we say that's a, you're an innovator at that point, which mm-hmm. means you're a Muslim. Will bur- you can be buried in the Muslim. You can do anything that's solo, mm-hmm. like burial. Go to Mecca, go to Medina. You could do those things. Enter m- m- masajid. You could do those things. Mm-hmm. But uh, your deeds, we don't believe, will be accepted. And, but those people, do you think that they'll go to hell and eventually be relieved from that at some point? Or not the zindiq. The no. zindiq. The path of Zendika, mm-hmm. we would say that is a path of permanent hellfire, mm-hmm. right? But the innovator, yeah. right? The innovator is someone who we say, yes, that he's not going to be treated like a kafir, right? right? He, and actually, we have a bigger principle in the Maliki school. If, if, if uh, the teacher who I learned this from, uh, I'm assuming that he's giving a larger principle of the Maliki school, which is that 
anyone who says la ilaha illallah muhammad rasulullah someday in eternity as he puts it that word will benefit him we cannot make him totally equal to the kafir right so that might actually include the zindik as well yeah but yeah, yeah. that's that's what my point was going to be that yeah. that a large portion of them would claim that you know that they they would say la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. Yeah, well, some of these guys <laughs> wouldn't even say that. But let's just say, yeah. for sake of argument, they the said ones that. that do, then the ones that then say. we said that what what they're upon is definitely a path uh, to towards Jahannam. Right. It's not a path to paradise, and there's only yeah. two paths, right? right. So, uh, but, but that phrase, be. that phrase, can, someone who utters that phrase with sincerity cannot be treated equally to someone who refused it for permanently, right? right. So. Uh, therefore, we say that one day in eternity uh, they may be saved. But we do also say that the hadith of the Prophet wasallam, where he's at the fountain and the believers are coming to him mm-hmm. and he's calling upon people and the angel stops certain people. They say, not him. Mm-hmm. He changed the religion after you. Mm-hmm. So what did the ulama say? They said he, they it means it refers to innovations and heresies in beliefs, mm-hmm. right? Not in actions, mm-hmm. in beliefs. So uh, actions will be uh, uh, innovations of worship and action. We consider that sinful. We don't consider that to be a doctrinal matter. So let's say I say, all right, from now on in my mosque, after every Juma, we're going to do 10 jumping jacks. Right. And we're going to believe that that's we're going to consider that a sunnah. Right. We would say that's sinful. Yeah. Right. It doesn't remove me from being a Sunni Muslim. You, you, yeah. Right. It's sinful. Or if I say, let's all wear a special ring. And it's going to bring you something, you know, who knows what. Then it's uh, bid'a in that respect. So it's mm-hmm. of action. So we hold those people to be uh, on an unfortunate path. It's, uh, it's on a path to hell. Right. Right. And there's no doubt about that. We can't mince words on that. But Definitely. the word, la ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, when said with sincerity, cannot be made equal to someone who refused to say it. Right. Right. So someday in eternity, it'll benefit from it. But right. if the messenger of Allah is gets angry at the fountain where there's only two options there's heaven and there's hell mm-hmm. right and he's calling to people to paradise and then he gets angry with people and says go away go away go away right and he's the messenger of mercy he's the prophet of mercy then what does it tell you how bad these uh, types of things are right Definitely. these these major blunders in doctrine are mm-hmm. right all right jazakum Allah khair. dr amin any final say Here. Uh, these guys are missing out on the beauty that is the prophet and following his example i mean you know science is king these days and and, and if you fast two days a week it helps your immunity it helps us helps, you know what i'm saying it's it's just such a silly thing and the second thing is that if god is the witness over everything then how do you do moon sighting I mean, the word is shahada. I mean, that just throws the moon sighting thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. I mean, how, how would you even know the month? You, someone needs to witness the moon to know the month. Right. Then again, they're probably not even fasting, right? Right. <laughs> so they don't even care less. Alhamdulillah. Jazakum Allah khairan. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Nashadu an la ilaha illa anta. Nastaghfiruk wa natubu ilayk. Wal asr inna al-insana lafi khusr. Illa al-lazina amanu wa aminu al-salihatu wa tawasaw bil-haq wa tawasaw bil-sabr. والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله قالوا حرقوه وانصروا آلهتكم إن كنتم فاعلين قلنا يا نار كوني There was a book I had written, Al Quran, the Ultimate Miracle. I had delivered talks on the subject, and there were videotapes and cassettes available. But this man, who originally made the discovery, which I found useful in talking to Muslims and non Muslims, 
But this man, a sickness has developed. Now he's claiming to be a new Rasulullah, like what Baha'u'llah was at one time, and Mirza Ghulam Ahmad. This is a sickness, this is a sickness that is quite common. You see, once a person, you know, he finds that he's so clever, that people are, you know, hero worshipping him. And, you know, whatever I say, I know these people will believe. So the man creates a sickness, this man I can make claims. Today, this guy called Rashad Khalifa, he is the man who discovered this theory, Ali Hatisat Asher. Now he said he is a new Rasul, he is a messenger of God. There are certain flaws in the theory, but besides that now he's claiming now, on the basis of that discovery that he is Rasulullah, and now he came out to prove first was that the Quran is Allah's Kalam, not changed, not one letter is changed. Now through the same theory he's proving, he's trying to prove that look the Quran is changed. That there are verses in the Quran which are not supposed to be there. Astaghfirullah. So I challenge this man to a debate. I send him a telegram that I am prepared to hire the Madison Square Garden in New York at my expense. I said, you Khabis from Tucson, come over. And he says, I've proved to the world that you are a kazab, a liar, and a cheat, and a false. False guy. So he says, no, I don't want to come to the Madison Square Garden. You come to Tucson in private. He wants to have a discussion. I said, look. You're rubbish. There's no time for me to talk to people in private. Come, come. You are the true messenger of God. Then come forward, man. I'm prepared to talk to you. So I have discontinued with the tape as well as the book as in the cassette. No more.